So this image of Steve Jobs is perhaps one of the most iconic portraits of the last 20 years. But what exactly makes this image so good? Today, we're going to talk about conventions of portraiture and a little bit about why you shouldn't rely on them. Thank you for staying with me after a little intro. If this video is interesting and useful, you can do all the little YouTube doobly doos. So as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about what are the conventions of portraiture and how they are utilized in making such a great portrait. This image of Steve Jobs is Albert Watson's portrait from 2006. And I'd say it is synonymous now with who Steve Jobs was as a person and is probably the image that we all think of when we're talking about him. That is mainly because it was used in 2011 as the main image on all the PR around his death. It was used by Apple in the announcement of his passing in the press releases and it became used as the cover of his biography. So what is it specifically about this image that makes it work so well and makes it become so iconic? Roland Bart wrote that the success of an image can be judged by how well it meets convention in comparison to how well it meets the expectation of the viewer. So this first part convention is essentially the rules and guidelines which have been established which determine that a picture is a portrait or is a landscape or is a documentary image. They also guide us in understanding the image and they also guide us on how well an image has been technically made. David Bay outlines the conventions of portraiture as four specific things. Those are face, pose, clothes and location. So we're going to look at this image of Steve Jobs with those four conventions and at the same time it'll give us a good way of understanding what Bait meant by those four things. When Bait is talking about face, he's speaking about the literal presentation of the individual in the image, their physical appearance. So we can see here that Jobs is looking healthy and fit. This image is obviously not taken close to his death. Jobs is well groomed. He's had a recent haircut. His beard is nicely trimmed. His skin looks fresh, looks luminous. There's very little sign of wrinkles, very little sign of discoloration, even though he's a black and white image, but you would still get um, tonal differences. We can see that his eyes are clear. We see that Jobs' face is filling the entire frame. All these literal things that we see within the frame also give us an idea of the unseen elements of Steve Jobs. Typically a well-groomed face and healthy skin is indicative of someone who likes to look after themselves, likes to present themselves well, takes good care of themselves and has a lot of self-esteem and pride. But it's also an indicator of wealth and prosperity. You know, it's not cheap to look well groomed and have a healthy diet and have a healthy lifestyle which comes through in a picture. The second aspect of Bates conventions is the pose. And this is typically what we think of when we think of portrait photography. How do we position that person within the frame? How do they present themselves? How do we describe characteristics which are unseen? And this is all achieved through the pose. Here we see Jobs taking on a fairly stereotypical view of the thinking man. Now, in photography, this has been adopted and used multiple times, but we do see it as far back in Roman and Greek sculpture. We see it in Rodin's The Thinker. We see it throughout Renaissance painting. And it's this idea that the weight of the mind is so heavy that one needs to rest it on the chin. We also see other nods to historical convention. The tilting of Jobs' head forward Enlarging the forehead is symbolic of someone who's got a large mind. Again, alluding to the great thinker. Jobs' pause here is also directly engaging the viewer. Both his eyes are staring straight forward into the camera lens, which is a challenge to the viewer almost. It's a very domineering view. It is, I know that I am being looked at and I want you to see who I am. Now, that's emphasised with a very, very slight upward angle to the camera, which positions Jobs slightly above the viewer. 
another technique of ensuring power and domination within the viewer subject relationship. Bates' third convention, clothes, is something that's already closely related to Steve Jobs. And this is because of his insistence on wearing the same clothes consistently. He's known for his black turtleneck, his jeans and his trainers. Here, we do only see the black turtleneck, but it's a silhouette that we recognise from the multiple times we've seen him in public. I'd say that Jobs is trying to challenge the idea of who a CEO is and what a CEO was. He's also trying to speak to an artistic and uh, minimalist approach to his work. He's very focused on presenting himself as a bit of a hippie, a bit of an alternative person, a bit new age, and someone who is concentrating on the aesthetic of the product as well as its viability as a business. This minimalism is reflected in his glasses. They are rimless around the actual lenses themselves and very, very thin on the arms. And that speaks to his design aesthetic, but it also leaves the face very clear from obstruction. It appears that he's the type of person who wants to be able to stir. He wants to be able to make eye contact. I assume from the rumours of his behaviours in meetings and disagreements with staff that he likes to dominate arguments and discussions. And no doubt part of that is through his eye contact and his very prolonged stir. The, the design of the glasses helps emphasise that. This focus on minimalism really helps to make Jobs prominent within the frame. It's reflected in the background. His choice of styling also helps focus the attention onto his face and not some distracting pattern on his shirt. And one aspect which crosses over between the pose and clothing is the display of Jobs' wedding ring as he reaches his hand up. Now, judging by the aesthetic of the image, this is a very purposeful inclusion. Rather than having Jobs rest on his right hand, he has chosen to rest him on his left. There is a certain amount of balance that the left brings in the raising and lowering of the shoulders, but it also reveals to us um, a symbol of commitment. Now, Jobs is not known for being a family man, so maybe this ring is to signify his commitment to Apple, to show that he's a man who is going to see it through. So the final convention that Bates suggest is location. Now here it is a very, very simple location, a white background, empty space, devoid of any distractions, any clues to where he is or who he is or any supplementary information. But that helps us again focus particularly on jobs as an individual, but it also emphasizes that individuality. We know the story of jobs raising Apple from the brink of bankruptcy to being one of the largest companies in the world and a lot of people attribute that to his leadership and by his leadership they mean him as a sole individual leading the, the business to success. This white background helps communicate that. It also gives an ethereal kind of feel to the image that somehow Jobs is a little bit more blessed than the standard everyday person. It also emphasizes the minimalist approach, the design aesthetic, the simplicity of it all mirrors the simplicity of Apple's advertising. The overall effect is to present an image of an independent leader, free from distractions, free from hindrance, but also responsible as the singular visionary for this business. There's also a couple of other points that I want to add to this discussion, which are the purposeful use of black and white. Now in 2006, black and white was a, a choice to be made. You had color film to hand, so you, you had to have a reason to use black and white. And typically the use of black and white in modern times is to remind us of a certain style of photography prior to color. And that is a documentary style. A certain amount of truthfulness is associated with it. This um, truthfulness comes from the idea that black and white photography was untouched. It was made by independent people. It wasn't for advertising or marketing, so it wasn't vulgar in the same way. But here the black and white also adds to the sense of minimalism. It's an aesthetic choice. So hopefully through that quick rundown of Bates' four conventions, you can see how 
even on the surface level where we're quickly looking at the image you can pull out key aspects which have certain connotations associated with them and all those different aspects build up in layers and kind of create a character for us to interpret from the image now as i mentioned before a lot of these conventions they come from uh, art history and have been used for hundreds of years and you don't need to have the knowledge of art history to be able to understand the conventions because they become so ingrained in society that we almost instinctively know what they mean and what they allude to and really it's at this point we can answer the simple question of why is this picture so great why does this portrait work so well so to answer that we're going to go back to what roland bart said and in short he explained that a successful portrait is when the conventions are correctly used to create an image which meets our expectations and what he meant by meets our expectations is generally when we see a portrait of someone we already have a preconceived idea of who that person is it could be a brother sister mum dad it could be a world leader it could be a company leader over the time of us knowing that person whether that's through mass media or through actually knowing that person living with them every day we have key characteristics which we attribute to that person they could be chatty they could be intelligent they could be business leaders so when a portrait meets expectations what we're actually saying is in that image we can see the characteristics that we associate with that person so as Roland Bart describes it, this image works because it's really good use of convention in order to communicate characteristics about Steve Jobs which meet our expectations of him based on his public persona. It's the idealised version of him. It's the version that he wants us to see and he tells through mass media and through his actions at Apple. It's almost a story in which he is confirming his position there and getting the support of the shareholders and ensuring that his legacy is continued. There is one issue with this law, and that is it's a very one-dimensional picture of Steve Jobs. And by that, I mean, whilst it tells us is idealized and is somewhat ideological version of himself, it does ignore his estrangement from his family. It ignores his estrangement from his best friend. It ignores the troubles he had hiring a mentor who then went on to be the person who fired him from Apple in the first place. All these struggles and all these complications as an individual have to be scrubbed away in order for it to work as a singular image. The convention doesn't allow for us to have a multitude of different versions of that person within the same image. Now the question of one dimensional images is raised by Stuart Hall. In his work on representation he highlights how a one dimensional image can become a stereotype. So here this one dimensional image is a very positive one and a stereotype of Steve Jobs is a very positive one. But it can equally be a negative one based on how convention is used. Things like a, a, an upward angle to denote power can equally be a downward angle to denote that someone is submissive. And we see this, again referring back to Hall, in how representations of marginalised groups are brought around. Rather than complex documentary uplifting or investigative reports, we see singular images which project a stereotypical view. So why is it that we shouldn't just take convention or this image of Steve Jobs, for example, and copy and paste it onto someone else? Well, one of the main issues is around expectation. If we took this exact technique and applied it to Boris Johnson or Donald Trump, it will come across as pastiche. It will come across as if they were trying to adopt Steve Jobs as the person they wanted to be rather than it truly representing their character. Another issue that Stuart Hall raises is around conceptual maps. And essentially what he's saying is every single person has different interpretation of the world around them. What one person deems as positive, another person could see as negative. And in creating portraits that are restricted to convention, you are limiting the audience appeal. The conventions that we've discussed today are primarily Western and white conventions. That means they'll primarily work within a Western audience. And because these conventions work within a Western audience, they're not necessarily appropriate for use for people of colour. John Berger also wrote about how conventions of art can secure positions of power. In the past, large-scale portraiture was used and displayed in public places to ensure that the general masses knew who the leader of the area was. This forced the looking up to the person. It ensured that leadership and this individual as a leader appeared natural it appeared as if it was in the order of things 
So this means that conventions not only deal with how we communicate a character about someone, but it's also to do with the power relations between the person being depicted and the people doing the viewing. Again, convention may not be appropriate for use with any marginalized group. As Hall points out, we could be creating a stereotype for that group. As Berger points out, it could be demonstrating power over that group. So I suppose the real question is, how do we get around that? And the most common response to that is through subversion. So I've decided to share an image with you, which I feel summarizes a lot of these questions quite well. And it's an image of Queen Elizabeth II, but here she's been depicted as a person of color. And it comes from the What If series from 1993 by Tybo Kalman. It raises a lot of questions about how we perceive people of power, how we feel that we understand who a person is through their image. It also asks us to consider how do we see that person differently when they are presented as a person of color? Why isn't it that we see people of color in these kind of positions and are the conventions suitable for use when representing people of color? I think it's a really interesting one to have a mull over. It's a little bit of a homework assignment for anyone who's made it this far. And if you have, thank you very much. You can do the YouTube stuff if you like. Finally, I just want to ask anyone who's got any comments or contributions or questions or ideas, please leave them in the comments because I'm always looking to learn more and get ideas from wider afield. I'm doing my reading the best that I can, but I'm always looking to learn more and from a wider set of voices. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to doing some more videos. I've had a lot of struggles with this one with audio issues and camera issues and stuff like that, but I'm thinking I might have solved it now. So I should be doing stuff on semiotics and denotation, connotation, power relations, quite a lot of philosophical ideas, but things that really influence how we make images. Thank you.